Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So Jesus is talking about hell and he's talking about a literal flame, a burning hot flame in hell. Yes, hell does exist. Yes, hell is there. And yes, Jesus warns us of hell many, many times in the Bible, and the whole Bible does. But before we go into the message that incorporates part of hell, I want to go to this part of the message, which talks about the beggar. Now, the beggar, a lot of people today see beggars as a nuisance, as someone that is a bothersome thing. We in America, I know this uh, televised is all over the world, but we in America see people from time to time in department stores and around locations on the corners with signs up saying, we'll work for food. That is a bit of a scam. They do this just to get money, most of them. They're not out of work. That is their job to go out with signs, perfectly healthy men and women, and solicit money as beggars. However, when you offer them, you know, work for their food, they don't want to work. They want to say, no, I don't know how to do that, I can't do that, and they'll weasel out of it. So it's not talking about this sort of beggar in the Bible. Back in biblical days, in Mosaic law, there was amp help for the poor. In other words, if a person was not blessed with great riches and they did not have much, those who were blessed with great riches and had much would help the poor. They would help those that worked hard, tried to make ends meet, done what was expected of them in society. They would help them. And there was Mosaic laws that led to this that had them to help these people. And there were amp help for those who were poor. So, there was not a big issue on this. God set up His kingdom in Israel, so to speak, as one that would help everybody. Everybody would have some sort of help. However, by the time of Christ, this help of the Mosaic law was mostly replaced with greed. Greed. People became greedy. They started to think, look, I can have more if I don't help the poor. Now, some poor are legitimately poor. There's nothing they can do about it. People have health issues. People sometimes just have what we call sometimes a strand of bad luck. In other words, nothing seems to go their way. Everything seems to go the opposite of what uh, you know they need to prosper. But I don't know if it's bad luck or if it's just circumstances. But they are legitimately poor. They work hard. They try to do what they're supposed to do in society. They're not trying to be a nuisance to anyone. And they're legitimately poor. Now, it became a place where Israel did where basically they didn't help the poor anymore. They became greedy. And a lot of times the beggars would go to the temple and other religious places, sites around Jerusalem and Israel. And they would beg there because they remembered that Mosaic Law did indeed say that they were supposed to be helped by those that had plenty and were blessed with prosperity, so to speak. Now, in the time of Christ, it got to the point where man's hearts began to be hardened. They no longer wanted to help the poor. They no longer wanted to give what they had, what they were blessed with by God, what they accumulated through inheritances, big, great, wonderful wealth. They didn't want to share it anymore. So these beggars would appear from place to place and here to there and try to uh, receive some kind of alms, if you will, some kind of goods, some kind of help for their condition. Most of them, most of them were of handicaps. It's not like many nations today where people who are handicapped receive some sort of help. You can be handicapped in many different ways. Your legs can be messed up. Your back can be messed up. You can have deformities of sort. You can have mental disorders. You can have a lot of different handicaps. And these people had no help other than those who would give them something out of the generosity of their heart. Government was not set up to help them during that day and time. It seemed like the government, the law, if you will, Mosaic law, seemed to stem away from that. And those who officiated over that decided, look, we would have more if we didn't have to help them. So, yes, they were legitimate, what you call legitimate beggars. They absolutely needed help as human beings because they were less fortunate physically and mentally than others. So they did legitimately need help. Now we see the world today is changing and it seems like uh, this has been taken advantage of even in 
societies. You see people all over in America, all over the world, who work, they sit on their porches, I mean, who don't work, they sit on their porches every day. They draw some kind of welfare from a, uh, from a government of some sort, a local, a federal, a state government. They draw funds from them, and they never work. They never want to work. It's got to the point where absolutely government has got to the point where they give them this stuff, and they expect it. In fact, in America, we have a democracy. You vote for your leaders. Most of these people will vote for those who will give them stuff where they don't have to work. Folks, that is wrong, but that's not what we're talking about today. Jesus is talking about a legitimate person who needed legitimate help and absolutely should have been helped. Now, it has replaced, it has replaced during this time of Moses, it has been replaced with greed. They decided we're no longer going to help them. The poor were then forced to succumb to begging. They had no choice in the matter. People stopped caring for humans over possessions. And I'm not promoting today that we should cut all poor people off based on what we see as far as poor people having an entitlement attitude. In other words, I deserve this. I should get this and take this from whoever. I'm not promoting that. What I am promoting is this, that yes, we should help those that need help because it's the right thing to do. There are people who are good, hard-working, honest people who need help. And folks, if a man or a woman is hard-working and they need a helping hand, or if they're handicapped in some way, they're misfortunate in some way, they absolutely should get a helping hand, especially from those who call themselves born-again Christians. If you call yourself a born-again Christian, you should be the first to help another. Did Jesus not tell us, if you have two coats and a, mer a person needs one, give them one. In other words, we as Christians should not cherish everything on earth. We should not become greedy. We should not become prideful of what we have. Yet you see so little of help from Christians today that the government found the opportunity to come in and to take over helping the poor to get the poor to vote for them so that they can pass wicked laws. Now you see how the devil turned this upside down. But the Christians should be the ones that everyone goes to who legitimately needs help and get it. The churches, the Christians. And Christ promoted this. Christ said this was the right thing to do. But then we see an example of someone not doing it. But there's more to the story. There's a thing involved here that we need to take note of. It has two parts. One is pride, one is humbleness. One is pride, and one is humbleness. And both are, both are represented in this story that Jesus tells us. Now, Jesus in verses 9 and 10 contrasted an uncharitable rich man with a beggar. A man that was greedy with a beggar. A legitimate beggar. A person who had no means to make a way for himself. The Bible tells us that he was literally laying at the rich man's gate. Which means he had no use of his legs. There was nothing he could do. Perhaps it was a back injury. Perhaps his legs were gone. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly what was wrong with him. But it does tell us that he was unable to sit or walk or stand. He had to lay down which means that he was seriously handicapped. And he would lay at the rich man's gate waiting for crumbs from the rich man's table. The Bible told us that he fared sumptuously. In other words, he ate well. He had plenty of food. And he had so much food, like many people in America today, that they throw away tons and tons and tons and tons of edible good food rather than give it to somebody. And he done the same thing. He had so much food that he would throw this food away rather than go out to this beggar and give it to him. Now, he should have had this beggar in his house because he had so much. He should have brought this beggar into his house, gave him a decent bed to lay on instead of an old stone street to lay on. He should have brought him in and fed him well and took care of him because it could have been him as well as the beggar who was handicapped. 
That was faith. That was the way God designed it. But it wasn't because the rich man was particularly a good person or special in God's eyes. It's just the way that God made them. Now, I would rather be poor and humble than rich and proud and greedy. So Jesus has given us a contrast here of the two and what results from the attitude of being both ways. In other words, how do I act when I'm this way and how do I act when I'm that way? And that matters overall. That matters in the end. And we're going to see in the story here how that will and does indeed matter in the end. Now, verse 20, it says that he laid at his gate with sores. Basically, he was unable to stay clean. He didn't have the abilities to first stand up and walk to a bath and take a bath. He had no ability to do that. No one would take him and clean him up. What choice did he have other than to lay there and become dirty? And then sores form all over him. Probably mites from rats running around. Probably bugs biting him. Laying there all night long. Mosquitoes and other bugs and insects biting him. Making these horrible sores that he was unable to clean and take care of himself. And these, stores, these sores started to form on him. And you say, and you judge somewhat and say, well, surely he could have cleaned himself up. No, he couldn't. He couldn't walk. He couldn't get around. He couldn't do anything. And if you were unable to walk, would you want to crawl around on old stone and cobblestone and, and, and hard streets all the time, busting up and blooding up your knees and legs and dragging your legs across old stones and things like it? Would you want to do that? In the first place, it would make it worse, wouldn't it? To scrape your legs and to bloody them up, dragging them across some cobblestones or something. And in Jerusalem, that's all they had was stone roads. So his best alternative was to lay there. And these sores would form on him from insect bites and mites and perhaps even rats coming up and biting him. I don't know. But he definitely, according to what Jesus said, had great sores on him. He was handicapped. He couldn't walk. And he had all these bad things that were going on in his life that humbled him. There was no pride in him. What was it that he could have been proud of? Nothing. Now I want you to take for a moment and to imagine to be in this man's place. There's nothing you can do to help your circumstances. Nothing. There's no one that will come and give you a lending hand. No one that will show you kindness and charity and mercy. Nobody. You're a living human being laying on the street 24-7. You happen to get close enough to a man's house who is wealthy and rich and felt like out of all their abundance, Maybe they'll give me something they don't need. They don't need. But instead, they just throw it away. They don't want to acknowledge you. They don't want to see you. They don't want to think about you. Because there is this little bit of guilt that comes with acknowledging you. And they don't want that guilt. Pride. Greed has taken them over. The humbleness has left. The humbleness would say, hey, that could be me. And I want to help them. And they would go over and they would help them. But obviously this rich man had become very proud, very greedy. greedy. He come to the point where he didn't care anymore about another human being. Thinking he was above that type of human being. Thinking that that type of human being, surely they can do something to help themselves. But you know, if you were this man, there's nothing I would love better than to help myself. I would love to get up, walk over to that bath, and clean myself. I would love to go over in that field and work 
sun up to sundown and earn me a little bit of money. And go buy me a good hot meal. Something to drink. I would love nothing better. Such a luxury to have me a house to go into that I can call mine. I would love nothing better to have friends come over in my house and sit down and have a meal with me that I bought and could share with them. But you know there's nothing you can do. Circumstances has led you to where you are. And there's no pride in you. You're very humble. So we see the two parts. Pride and humbleness. Greed, pride, humbleness. He laid there. And the fact is, with these swords and all these things that was on him, a little health care for the beggar would have been the right thing to have done, wouldn't it? That would have been the right thing for the rich man to have done. You see, we do need to care for one another. And we see prejudice, hate, malice all over a world that a loving, good, merciful God created. What must God think about our hearts. He gave us everything we need and has blessed us with a wonderful world to live in. But we have used each other as victims and have taken and taken because of greed and pride. You see, we're opposite of what God had intended. Pride and greed are opposite of who God is. And folks, we have become so callous to it that we don't even want to recognize those who are without because we're scared of a little bit of guilt that might come to us. Now, I'm not saying the whole world has come to this point. There are some people who are very charitable and who have wonderful hearts. Good Christian people. Good people who are not born again Christians. But as a whole, God sees a world of greed and pride. There are those though, that every now and again shine to another person who has nothing. They shine. And that person who has nothing sees them in a way that makes a difference their life. You know, there was a missionary that went over to a village in Africa. And in this village, there was a lot of people with leprosy. And these people knew and expected everyone to run and to get away from them as soon as they found out that these individuals had this leprosy. They become complacent. They, they were used to it. Complacent to the fact that people didn't want to be around them. But this missionary came into this village knowing that it was a village that had a lot of leprosy. There was maybe one or two people in that village that took care of the people who had leprosy, knowing that they very much was accessible to becoming lepers themselves by helping lepers. But they done it anyway. Maybe one or two of them. Now, the people in this village had the dark skin and this missionary had the light skin. Now, of course, they assumed right away they think they're better than us. That's what they think. Because he has, he's a white man versus black people. And he walks into the village and they assume, of course, when he finds out that we're lepers, he's going to take off. He's going to run, he's going to get out of here, and we'll never see him again. But he came into the village with goods, with medications, the things that you could rub on sores and places of, you know, injury, so to speak, from the leprosy. And he came into the village, and he came into a shack of a certain man. And this certain man invited him in who had leprosy. He said, sure, come on in my house if you dare. If you really dare to come in here, come on. So he came in. And so he gave him some medical supplies. He said, this will help you with your leprosy. Rub it on your places of injury, and they should help it. It'll at least ease the pain. And the man looked at him and said, 
Why don't you put it on for me? The missionary looked at him. He said, well, okay. So he took uh, gall and he started rubbing it all over his injury places of leprosy, all over the man. And then the man went over there and he sat down at a table and he said, I'm going to have my meal. He said, you want to eat with me? He said, sure, I'll eat with you. I'm hungry. So the man made a meal and he sat down. And he took one bowl. It was like a soup with a piece of meat in it. And the leopard took the bowl and he drank out of it. And he set it back down. He said, go ahead and have some. And he knew for sure this was the end of this guy. That he was going to leave the village. He wasn't going to come back. There is no way that he's going to eat after me. And the missionary felt, I have got to eat out of that boat. I have no choice. He's invited me into his home. He's invited me to help him medically, to help him clean him up. He's invited me to eat with him. And there's a reason he's doing it. He wants to see if I really care. And I've got to eat out of that bowl to show him I really care. So the man took the bowl and he drank some soup out of it and set it back down. And then he said, will you wrap my sores? So the missionary took some bandages out and wrapped the sores around the man's leprosy and said, I hope everything goes well. He said, but let me tell you, what you have is external. It's on the outside. And it's destroying you. But there's something bigger and more important that's going to destroy your soul one day. And that's sin in its nature. And what it does, it's destructive. It eats at your soul and it destroys it. I want to tell you about someone that can remove that sin from you. And His name is Jesus Christ. He can cleanse you. He will suck with you. He will cleanse you. He will do all the things that I have shown you that I will do externally. He will do for you internally. He loves you. And I want to invite you today to accept this Jesus Christ. The guy just sat there and looked at him. The one with the leprosy. Stared at him. Glared at him. The missionary said, I hope you'll make that decision. He got up to walk out of his house. And before he got to the door, the man bursted out crying and said, I know that you love me. And I know that you love me because this Jesus taught you how to love. And I will accept it. You see, we do have to show this mercy. This desire to help others as born again Christians. It is our job. It is who we are. It is what God has placed within us. But we have become complacent, have we? Cold, callous. And folks, we shouldn't do that. Now, the only medical help the beggar received laying at the gate of the rich man, was dogs which licked his sores. That was it. No one cared. No one came out and said, can I give you some ointment for these sores? Can I give you a good hot sandwich? A meal of some sort, some bread? Something. No one. But it was as though God had sent the dogs over to lick his sores. Now it's strange that the Bible says this. Because you know what they know for sure right now? Do your research. That a dog's saliva has a chemical in it that causes infections to not build up and sores to heal. So it's like God had sent these dogs over to lick the sores of this person. This beggar. That help keep him under control. To give him a little bit of comfort while he's on earth. And we sometimes as born again Christians become greedy and think that we deserve a whole lot of comfort in this world. That we should have everything. 
You see televangelists in America, they're on television. They say if you ain't rich and 100% healthy, you're not in God's will. That's a lie of the devil. We're not promised great health and great wealth in this world. As born again Christians, God gives us peace inside. And what we have in this world don't really matter because we're going to leave it behind anyway. But that peace inside should beam out of us like that missionary. And people should see that. We should be a billboard for God, for Jesus Christ to the world. The beggar received nothing. The dogs came over and licked the sores to help him. The beggar, as we see here, has physical handicaps and sores. But folks, greed, greed creates infection in the soul. And that's the wrong place for infection to sit in. Because it will destroy your soul. Jesus once said, Worry about the one who can take your soul more than those who can take the life in your body or your body and destroy it. Don't worry about that. Worry about your soul. And greed and pride causes infection into your soul and it destroys you. It makes you cold, callous, uncaring, unloving. And unable to reach those who have already been trodden down and humbled and prepared and ready to receive Jesus Christ. Greed. Pride. They're both brothers. And guess who the Father is? His name is Satan. He's the author of both. And folks, we must be the opposite. We must be. A man full of greed and pride has no desire for God. I don't know of anybody full of greed and pride who has a desire for God. Do you? A real desire for God. You take your highly paid academias, your Hollywood crowd, your rich people, your rich oil tycoons around the world, your kings and your leaders. Well, pride, greed has set into their hearts. They have no desire for God. It separates us from God because that's not who God is. God's neither proud nor greedy. God is the opposite. Above. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever perish. In other words, He gave Jesus for those who will die without God. He gave you so that you wouldn't have to. Folks, isn't that wonderful news? That's wonderful. And what more can you give than your only begotten Son? God gave of Himself. He gave a part of Him. And what more can you give than a part of you? The missionary went into this leper's little house, his little hut. And He gave of Himself. Even if I catch leprosy, to win this man to Jesus Christ is worth it. He gave of Himself. You see, God is the opposite of greed and pride. We should be the opposite of greed and pride. We want to set ourselves on a pedestal. Detach ourselves from the not so fortunate. And God will judge these preachers promoting this stuff. He will. They have a greater damnation for what they're doing. Jesus never promoted money and health. Never. Nowhere in the Bible. You won't see it. But to line their own pockets, they do it. And God will judge them for it. 
verse 22, Jesus then points out the beggar died. And what happened? He went to Abraham's bosom. Bosom. Now, what does this mean? This means that he was taken to a place called paradise, as Jesus mentions paradise when he's hanging on the cross with the thief, the two thieves. But to one thief he mentions paradise. Paradise is a place where you more or less waited for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to accept Jesus Christ to go to heaven. Abraham, Elijah, different ones, they're there. They were there until Christ rose from the grave and they received Him. Well, it doesn't say He stayed in the grave, does it? It doesn't say that He went to purgatory, which don't exist. It said paradise. So, you don't go to the grave and stay there. The soul goes somewhere else. So as soon as the beggar died, he went to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom, where Abraham was. That's where he went. He was okay now. In his humbleness, I can imagine him laying there day after day after day after day, giving up on everybody in society. Everybody that walked by him daily, going to their jobs, going to the market, going somewhere, doing something, would walk by and turn their heads so they wouldn't have to look at him. He gave up on everybody but God. Somehow, some way, he knew inside his heart, his mind, and in his spirit, God still loves him. You may not. You may walk by me. But God loves me. God, I love you. Thank you for that dog. Thank you for these crumbs. God, this ain't such a wonderful life, but you love me and I feel it. Somehow I feel it. I know why that dog runs around them streets over there. I, I can see him running up and down the alleys. See an old dog, you know, he's running around, sniffing everything, his tail up in the air. I see him running down them alleys, but all of a sudden, about 2 o'clock every day, he'll look over here if and he'll come running over here and start licking these sores. I know why he does that. You sent him over here, didn't you? Thank you, Lord. He received God in His humbleness. No one else, no one else could help him but God. God did. He went to Abraham's bosom and guess what? The last was first. And all of a sudden that, that was on the bottoms on top. Now he can stand up. Now he can walk. I bet when he got up there he looked for some water just to feel that water on him all over. This is how it feels. Oh, my soul feels clean and this glorified body I'm in feels clean, but I just want to feel that water on me. He looked over there and boy, there's this big old supper, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and all these people's over there eating. And, Come on over here, boy. Come, we got a big plate. We got a place right here for you. Get over here. He went over there and just ate and ate and ate and ate. And the Bible does tell us this, doesn't it? Remember Jesus? After He rose from the grave, He sat down and eat fish with His disciples. It's a time of fellowship, isn't it? It's fun to sit down and eat a meal together. And He sat down with them and He ate a meal. All He wanted. He ate to His belly was poked out like Carly's over here. Yeah. And it was good. Now He's on top. No more sores, no more sickness, no more aging, no more hunger, no more dirty. Laying on that hard, cold street. And you know, even the best part, no more insects to bite him. No more mosquitoes to bite him. And I imagine he had a place to call his own. He was on top. You see, the last is first, now the first is going to be last. 
when a person has great needs, that is the closest they will ever come to humbleness. You know, you see people all day long when they have plenty and everything's going well for them, they rarely think about God. Well, the bills is paid and, you know, the, the house and everything's good and we've got plenty of food. And how often do you sit down during times like that and you think about how good God is? You become complacent and think that you are supposed to have that. And there's people all over the world. In America especially, we have plenty. And we become complacent. We wouldn't have nothing if it weren't for God. But we've come complacent to having those things. But when the first tragedy happens in our lives, even here in America, the first thing we do is say, God, so-and-so is deathly sick, so-and-so died, my bills, they're getting ready to you know, foreclose on my house, Lord, I need you. All of a sudden it brings a humbleness, great need. And sometimes it's important for God to keep you in great need, to keep you humble, so that He can reward you for eternity. You see, eternity is the greater blessing. Eternity. It's the closest we'll ever come. And then come to salvation. Humbleness, and then salvation. Then, the Bible tells us, in the rich man's false security of wealth. He too dies. But notice, after the body is buried, the soul, verse 23, goes to hell. Remember we were talking about hell earlier. The place Jesus warns us about and is warning us about again right here in verse 23. Then, after the body is buried, the soul goes to hell. Again, no purgatory. He don't go to paradise. And he don't stay in the grave. Jesus said he went to hell. But then Jesus describes hell, doesn't he? It's a place of torments. Many different torments. I believe demons are torturing you constantly all the time in hell. There's great heat there. Far beyond what the human body can take. But you feel every degree of it. To a point where it's just so miserable, you're about to go insane. But you don't go insane because you have this little uh, thriving uh, bit of survival in you. That wants to survive it somehow. Because you still have a life. The soul is your life. You want to survive it. So you keep trying to survive. And it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. This madness with these torments, with this heat. But a body. You have a body of sort that cannot and will not be destroyed. The beggar went to paradise. The rich man said, Beggar, dip your finger in some water and put it on the tip of my tongue so that I am cool in these flames. You know, there's only one thing that we need to know about flames. They come from a fire. Right? So there must be a fire in heaven. I mean, not heaven, hell. <laughs> there must be a fire in hell. Amen? There's got to be. Jesus said there was. There is because Jesus said there was. And He's warning us about this. He's telling us you don't want to do this. Don't let greed and pride take away your humbleness to come to Me. He's spelling it out, folks. And you ain't got to be rich to be proud and greedy. You can have just a little bit and be proud and greedy. Proud in your heart. I don't need God. I'm happy with the little bit that I have. It's enough for me. No, I'm just not going to fool with this God stuff. 
But that's pride. Pride is not discriminative. It's in the rich. It's in the poor. It's in the black. It's in the white. It's in the male. It's in the female. It's in everybody. The devil is non-discriminative with pride. And God is telling us, don't let that set into your heart. It will destroy your soul. But he says the rich man went to hell where he was tormented in this flame. Folks, Jesus did not misquote his words. He knew exactly what he was saying and what he meant and said it. Hell's there. Hell's real. It's a fire that burns. It's a place of torments. And it's for everyone who does not humble themselves and come to Jesus Christ. He did not misquote it. It's true. Jesus explains a prideful, greedy spirit will destroy the soul with the contrast of a beggar and a rich man. Now, he uses a rich man because, yes, that has a lot to do with why a person's proud. They're self-sufficient. Yeah. And some people don't need riches to be self-sufficient. They just don't need God. Sin is the problem. And sin is why we have pride. And sin will never, ever be justified by God. Sin must die. It must die. How? How can sin die if we live? Only by God giving of Himself someone to become incarnate of Himself who is 100% holy and absorbing our sin from us. Then representing that sin in death and then rising again without it to live and represent us whom He absorbed the sin from. His name is Jesus. He came. And he performed this act. Jesus paid all our sin price. And if we can humble ourselves to come before Him and confess our sins and admit to Him that we need Him to have eternal life with God, to be born again, then He will come.